From the Flint Hills Writing Project, this is The Suggestion Box, where teachers get ideas. I'm your host, Andrea Marshbank. Today, I'm so pleased to be with Tara Lynn Kahn, who is a technology master teacher and awaiting her national board certification. She is entering in her 16th year of teaching in English language arts at the high school level, and I've also worked with her extensively through the Flint Hills Writing Project. I'm so excited to have her on here today. We're going to talk about her multi-genre project, which has had a lot of success in her class, and we're going to delve in to the nitty-gritty, and she has actually been so kind to provide some resources for us that will be available in the show notes of this episode if you would like to check out how she's doing this unit and get really into like the actual sources that she has. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the interview, and yeah, Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, Tara Lynn. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Andrea. I'm so glad you could make it down here to South Central Kansas. Oh, yes. Me too. Me too. And it was kind of a ride down here. (laughs) (laughs) We got to know this area very well. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Uh, We got a little bit lost on the way down here, but we found it. We found it. Google Maps let us down. Just a heads up. Uh. Kansas, Google Maps, you got to work on it. Um, (laughs) Okay, so today we're talking about your multi-genre unit, which I clarified as a project. Do you feel like project or unit or both? Which one in there? It's basically both. It's a unit, Uh but it's also a project because there is a presentation and it is more like a portfolio Uh type situation. Um, But because of the time involved, it's, it's an entire unit. Okay. Absolutely. And that, that makes sense because when you say multi-genre and I had, I'm thinking like multiple texts. Right. So what is the, the overview of the, the unit? Like what is this unit? Okay. This unit is a portfolio that the kids, where the kids collect um, different texts. Um, what I did is I, they admitted to me that they did not read To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> the assigned text. <laughs> Shocker. I know. <laughs> Um, and I deal mainly with sophomores. And so they admitted to me rather sheepishly that they didn't read To Kill a Mockingbird. And so that started the conversation. How many of them, how many of you guys do read outside of class? It's a good well, question. They, they don't have time. <laughs> yeah. Um, why didn't you read Mockingbird? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had also read um, Fahrenheit 451. We just finished Fahrenheit 451. And so in Wichita, we tend to teach the canon. Mm-hmm. And they, it's, it's so boring, Mrs. Khan, it's so boring. <laughs> it doesn't have any, any relevance in my life. So we started brainstorming what social issues did they see that they wanted, that they didn't see covered in the literature that we were presenting them in the district. Mm-hmm. So then I sat down and decided, okay, they need a voice. So I came up with this unit and um, one of the end, uh, uh, summat- one of the summative assignments was they had to write an argument paper. Is this a better way to learn versus like um, the whole class reads the same text and you do lit circles and you do a test? And of course, I think I had maybe three kids prefer the that way out of um, 105. Oh my goodness. That's so, were you surprised by their willingness to discuss like a, a new way to, a new way to learn? Like you, because as a teacher, it's, it's very rare. I think that we, we say, okay, you didn't read this text mm-hmm. and you have, first of all, having that honest dialogue, like that right. shows the depth of your relationship with your students. Like my students like yell it out to me on the last day of school, like as they're walking out the door, I didn't read that Marshbank, sorry, bye. Like, <laughs> um, so you had that conversation and then like you, you asked them what they wanted. Were they excited to talk about that yeah they they did but they didn't know what they wanted to read okay and that was even scarier i think for them um because when you talk to them about what would you well, what do you like to read uh they can't think of anything they've read that hasn't been class assigned mm. there's no free reading anymore mm-hmm. um and so that's so i kind of took the initiative and decided to do the young adult fiction mm-hmm. as our foundation okay so the multi-genre unit, the young adult fiction, is where, where you start. Right. Okay. And so what I did is I had them, uh, I gave them the strategies, but they picked the content. And so I gave them an outline of what they had to have in their portfolio. And then for six weeks, they just read 
and made connections and wrote analysis and that and did it. It was, it was based. It was an individually based project. Yeah, that almost sounds a little bit self paced. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is pretty much, which drove me crazy, <laughs> because my paradigm had had to shift because I was used to this assignment is due on this day and I grade and then I turned it in and I couldn't do that. Yeah. But then I run into the problem. Well, if I totally blow off the whole assignment and don't even grade it until the end, I'm going to have kids madly trying to catch up Mm -hmm. and do it all the night before, which I know is impossible. So we tweaked it a little bit. And so I told them, okay, here's what we'll do. I will have these assignments due regularly. So I can enter a grade in the grade book to keep mom and dad off our backs. Right. (laughs) That is important. <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't, if you miss that, it will still be a zero, but you can get credit for it in the end. So it was like a double credit situation. Oh, and it almost makes them more aware as they're going along. Like it, it hits their grade early. So they've got to know, okay, I got to come back. I got to make right. sure I get this right. right. And the other thing that was really good about it was they realized that, oh, you don't just arbitrarily assign us work. Mm-hmm. It actually all contributes to the end result. That was the big light bulb moment they had. Okay. Wow. I am I am excited and blown away <laughs> because in my class right now, we actually do. I'm an English teacher for those of you who are new to the suggestion box. And so I do a Lit Circles unit. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is by far, in my opinion, I think maybe in my students' opinions, I never ask them what their least favorite unit is, but I think if I did... It would probably be that one. So I'm excited. I want I want to know all about this. Okay. All right. Well, what we did is we went down to the library. I talked to the librarian ahead of time mm-hmm. and said, I want young adult fiction, modern, if at all possible. And um, they cover social issues. Because at the Kate conference last fall, I had attended one of those breakout sessions from Fort Hayes where they were talking about the diversity mm-hmm. in young adult lit. And they had talked about some of these books. I was like, oh, my God, this must be so good to read in a class. And I don't have any money. You know, yeah. I can't go out. So I talked to my librarian, and I had ordered some books, too. So I lent some of my books out to kids. And so we just kind of did book talks. And I told the kids, pick out a book, take it back to the room. And the first day of the unit, we checked out the book. And the rest of the class, they did nothing but read. And that way, if they were into the book, great. But, you know, say 15 pages into the book, they weren't into it. I let them go down and check out something else. Mm -hmm. So that helped. Good. And so they, they had time to read in class. But I told them that was the only day they could read in class. Okay. So it was mostly outside of class reading. Right. Right. Okay. So they picked out their books. And I let them read a couple of, of things and um, did some check. We did some uh, groundwork and then uh, discussions. Is, Are you liking the book? This is kind of cool, that kind of thing. And then I did an assignment, a group assignment, where uh, I enlisted chat stations. And what we did is, what are the social issues that you see in your book? Mm-hmm. And so I put up six posters And it was like family, um, social justice, laws, uh, LGBTQ, um, uh, mental health, all these different things. And then they just wrote their, uh, the title of their book on post-it notes and went around the room and slapped the book, slapped their book where they saw that social issue. Okay. So that was the very basic social issue. And then we came back into the classroom and then we used that as a springboard as to a Socratic, kind of a Socratic seminar about social issues in young adult fiction. And did they seem compelled? Like, were they like, did, did that process of chat stations and of physically putting the sticky note up help them see, oh, like, we do talk about family or we do right. talk about the LGBTQ community or racism or mental health? Well, not only did it do that, but it also helped them form connections between books. Ooh. So they were saying, okay, your book has deals with justice. Your book deals with Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Your book deals, you know, so they were seeing all of these connections all at once, gotcha. which was, I mean, I had goosebumps. Yeah. And I was being observed by my assistant principal at the same time. So I was like, oh, my gosh. That's such a good moment. You're like, this was the right day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, and, and I couldn't get him to stop talking. That was, that was the great part about it. Yeah. And then, um, then we moved from that day. So that was, that was one class period. 
and then um, I walked them through some of the things like dialectical journals. I wanted them to do dialectic journals so that I knew they were reading the book. Mm-hmm. So we did one together. Can I can I ask real quick what yeah. is a what is a dialectical journal? Okay, a dialectical journal is an avid um, strategy, and it's where in a, in a perfect classroom, <laughs> the student would select a quote from their text, and then write the uh, copy the quote, and then give you an analysis of it or a reader response. Okay. Um, we use them at Southeast. Um, very ex- extensively that's one of our our mtss strategies mm-hmm. um <clears throat> but then i had also been introduced to book snaps so i uh let the kids use book snaps as well and they had to have 20 dialectical journals but they could have five book snaps nice did you learn about book snaps i want to say it was tara martin yeah tara yeah. martin and lawrence yeah yep she runs around the kansas conference community and talks about it it's good it's good yep. stuff yeah I, I, I can't even remember where I heard about it, but I jumped online and saw her um, her videos and went, oh, yeah, this is all for me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so they do they do this consistent journal, mm-hmm. dialectic journal, book snaps to let you know that they're reading. Right. And right. they read mostly outside of class. Right. So is your in-class work at all related? The in-class was mostly workshop work. Okay. So when they were having trouble with their dialectical journals, like I don't know what to do and I don't know what to write about, that's where I would be the facilitator, buzzing around the room like a bee. Okay, have you done this? Have you talked about mood? Have you talked about theme? Have you talked about characterization? Have you talked about, um, have you addressed the uh, conflict resolution situation? Um, But we spent also a lot of time, uh, a couple of class periods actually, once I figured out or had down on paper what the social issues were in these books, Then it was my job to help guide them to places because one of the requirements in the portfolio was two nonfiction articles about a social issue. So that was my job for an entire week was to get them directed to websites or resources Mm -hmm. on social issue nonfiction articles. So now you're entering in that world of digital literacy and research and how do we Google and where do we put our trust in the media? And how does nonfiction deal with fiction? Yeah. Where are those connections made? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we went to a lot of websites. Um, we, we talked about credibility of sources um, and that kind of thing. And then the kids had to pick. The hardest thing was getting them to narrow it down to one social issue. Mm-hmm. And so I, at some point I said, all right, if you can't find two articles on a social issue, what are two social issues in your novel? Find an article for each. So you had to have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of the books that they selected were mental health related, Mm -hmm. which was rather interesting. I even had a kid reading Go Ask Alice. Oh, yeah? And he was excited about it. (laughs) And I was like, wow, that is such an old book. I read that in middle school. Oh, yeah, 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 me too. Have you heard the conspiracy theories about it? No. Oh, because, like, I was always told it was written by, or it was, like, assembled by, like, a mother who found, like, a bunch of, like, journal-y stuff from her, her daughter, Alice, per se, and then it was submitted anonymously. Had you heard similar things? I hadn't heard anything like that. Yeah, because it's written anonymously. And then right. one of my students the other, not the other day, but, like, a while ago was like, no, no, it was written by the government and produced, like, are published as an anonymous thing to, like, discourage kids from using drugs. And I'm like, that's so interesting because it's banned, like, everywhere <laughs> yeah. because it's supposed to, it supposedly encourages kids to use drugs. I don't know. Conspiracy theories are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Tara Lynn's I, like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a whole different level. There's, <laughs> there's honors right there. There's an honors thesis right there. Yeah, no, that would be, but that would be an interesting article if a kid brought one. Yeah. Uh, go ask Alice. So they've got a, they've got the journal, they've got their book snaps, they've got their two nonfiction articles. Right. Uh, they got their no, their uh, young adult fiction. Mm-hmm. And then the next week, then we focused on poetry. Mm-hmm. So I took it a week at a time. All this time they're reading the novel are expected to read their novel outside of class. Yes. Now, there were some, uh, you know, there's outliers. I had one kid who finished their novel in three days. Whoa. Mrs. Collin, this is the first book I've read all the way through. <laughs> and it was, if I remember right, it was Dante and Aristotle. Um, oh, you yes. You know the one I'm talking about? Yes. 
Dante and Aristotle, The Secrets of the Universe, or something like that. Yes, very, very good. Yeah, yeah. So she says, I've never read a book this fast in my life. It was hilarious. Um, So then we worked on poetry. Mm -hmm. And they had to find two poems that either connected with their novel or poems that dealt with their social issue. Mm -hmm. So once again, we were using digital texts. Um, I had all my poetry books out that they could look at. Um, I did have to outlaw Dr. Seuss, unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> well, can I read? Can I do Dr. No, you cannot do Dr. Seuss. I feel like he has some compelling stuff about, like, like if you had a kid reading The Book Thief and then The Sneetches, yeah. right? Like The Belly, The Star-Bellied Sneetches. Yeah. But most of the stuff. No green eggs and ham, right? Right. Right. <laughs> or one one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Right. You know? Right. Um, so... Then it got to the point on the poetry, it was rather interesting because I was looking for credible sites and it's really hard to find social issue poetry that is not restricted by a school filter. Mm. So went out to Poetry Foundation and they had um, like poetry contests and that kind of thing. So I started allowing if like Poetry Foundation had published it, it was credible. So um, they were, a lot of the poems were written by students right. in classes. Yeah. So I, I had to fudge that a little bit. The other element that we added was a two-voice poem that they had to write. And so we spent two class periods working on that. And they love two-voice poetry once they understand the strategy. Okay. Um, the two-voice poem is where you d- deal with an issue from two different perspectives. And it's, it's supposed to be read out loud, and um, there's always there's a chorus with, with the poem. You have one voice representing one perspective, another voice reading, representing a different perspective, and then the chorus is where they speak together. Uh-huh. And so they, once they figured that out, a lot of times they were having two characters had the two voice poem or they had a a um a victim like say if it was abuse mm-hmm. they had uh one one voice was the victim one voice was either the abuser or the person that they got help from sure so that those were very powerful um and it always seems like a two voice poem gets more depth out of high school students yeah. than anything okay because and, and I don't know that they really concentrate on it mm-hmm. so much as it's a way to be free to do it. Yeah. And I, I think that a two-voice poem, I, I'm lucky to be in a district where I have a lot of non-English teachers who do a lot of writing in their classroom. Our district has chosen to emphasize writing a lot. And so I'm over here thinking, like, two-voice poetry. I wonder, like, that, if you, you talked about, like, abuser and victim, and in a lot of situations, I'm like, that would work well in a ton of stuff you could talk about in history class mm-hmm. or... You know, maybe in like a, a a different sort of tone, it could be in science class too, right? Because you could do like the predator versus prey, or you could do you know something sillier, like the different, like maybe like plants versus animals, or not versus, but oh, I was thinking proton and neutron. Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome too. <laughs> yeah, you could really personify these things that kids kids generally distance themselves from. Like, you would never forget a proton once you had to stand up in front of the class and right. read a poem as a proton, right? Right. Okay, yeah, sorry, I got, I got a little sidetracked. That's okay, that's okay. And, wh- and when I first taught two voice poems, which I learned in the writing project, by nice. the way, um, when I first learned them, I had seniors, and I still use this, this one student's uh, example to this day because it was the only thing he turned in the entire semester. Oh, really? And we were studying um, night. yes. And we were also reading Mouse, okay. the graphic novel at the same time. And he did one about um, between a Nazi and a Jew. Mm-hmm. And it was the, I mean, it's like, where has this been? Yeah. Where has this kind of uh, level been? Instead of just walking in, putting your head down, and then leaving class. Where, somehow this kid connected with that. Yeah. Well, that you, one day. You found something that resonated. Yeah. I, that struck a chord somewhere. So it was just like, I mean, I had goosebumps, and I still use it, mm-hmm. and the kids all respond uh, very passionately to yeah. that poem. Is that something that is accessible via the, the links? I can make it available, yeah. Okay. I can make it available. Is that okay? Has he graduated? Are we good oh, on, Oh, yeah. Like... He's, it was 10 years ago. Okay. So we're good on, like... <laughs> okay. Just to make sure. We don't ever want to yeah. put anybody at risk. Yeah. 10 years ago. 
So, uh, but then after the two voice poem, so they had to go find five images that either connected with their uh, novel or their social issues. So they always had that ability to, um, it didn't all have to be focused on one point. Mm -hmm. they, could, they could change it up a little bit. So um, that was nice. So just to clarify, as your, your students are doing this throughout the unit, workshopping in class, reading at home, do they have to do these things in a particular order or do they bounce around? Um, I would do like a spot check mm -hmm. and that's the grade I would enter for the week. Okay. So if we were working on it in class, if they had something um, for the, it was like a check off. Did okay. you do it? Did you not? Okay. And then if they didn't do it, they would still be able to get points later on in the ultimate portfolio. Right. Uh, presentations. Well, so. and then you're giving like this ongoing feedback that even though it's minor, it's like letting them know you are you are holding them accountable. Right, right. They had to do a non-text representation, and this was my national board entry. <laughs> so this is the best part. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, they had to do a non-text representation of how they connected with the novel and how they connected with the social issue. So I set up like a triangle, and one point was the novel. One point was the social issue, and one point was them. And it had to be just images. And that was challenging for them because they couldn't... Some of them fudged and used word clouds, <laughs> <laughs> which cracked me up. And then the last thing that they had to do before the presentation is they had to write the argument essay. Okay. And that was more of a reflection piece. Did you like the way this was, you know, was taught? Um... Would you prefer to learn this way? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And out of your 105 students, only three really would have preferred to learn the more, like, kind of what we, we ascribe to, like, traditional right, canon. Right, right. Okay. And that's so interesting that students are, you mentioned earlier in the podcast how your students were, were very intimidated by the thought of, like, we get to choose what we read. Right. And I found that, too. Like, we, we were doing a writing camp literally over the past few days, and we asked the students at the beginning, what do you want from this writing camp? How can we serve you more? And it was really hard for them to mm -hmm. to conceptualize at first. Like, it took a minute. And so it's interesting that, like, by the end of it, they were all like, no, no, this way is so much better. Right, right. The other thing that gave them voice is they got to create the rubric. And I added that to the resource so you guys could see all... I had um, four classes doing this. Four sections. No, I'm sorry. Five sections doing this. <laughs> and... Each class made their own rubric, and we did use the single point rubric that I learned from my student teacher. I had never seen it before. I was like, this is pretty cool. So the kids created the single point rubric for their class. The interesting thing was the honors class, theirs was the most vague and general rubric. Really? Did that turn out well for them? Or is that... Well, it was really hard to grade. Yeah. They found out it was really hard to grade. My first hour, uh, sophomores, they were the most specific. And you would think 8 o'clock in the morning, they would not be on it, you know, but theirs was the most specific. They were craving that, yeah. that they need to know exactly how do they succeed. Exactly. They needed the black and white. But theirs was really funny because on their rubric, <laughs> they outlawed Times New Roman. <laughs> what? <laughs> Because I love Times they, New Roman. They were so tired of using it in the MLA format. They didn't want Times New Roman allowed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's a beautiful font. Have you reached? I'm sure you have. I'm like a baby. Have you reached that level of, like, font recognition where you can now recognize fonts based off of the first glance? Like when you oh, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that insane? So I don't know what I would do if they used other fonts. Like, it would throw me all off. Yeah. I'm just kidding. That's it's fine. We should probably use other fonts sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome though. That's well, awesome that you put I, that. I let them do that. I, I tell them that we'd use MLA format for the formal academic papers, that, but everything else, like their dialectical journals, right. do not have to be. But I said they can't be handwriting because yeah. I'm old. <laughs> but that's that's what we did. And so, then they had to do uh, with the portfolio. Then they graded each other. Okay. And um, the way I did it is I made, for every presentation, two classmates graded it anonymously. Mm -hmm. And then I averaged the grade. How did you do the anonymous? Like, how did you add that element? Um, 
basically, the kid who graded it, they didn't put their name on it. Um, I had the students, I made two copies for each student and put their name on it Mm -hmm. and shuffled them all up. Uh Uh-huh. And then as they walked in, they just grabbed two papers and walked to their desk, and that's who they were grading that day. Okay. So the students who were grading knew who they were grading. Right. But, like, their their comments would not have right. been recognized. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's really, like, I feel like this whole unit, as you continue going on and on, I get more and more excited about the ownership that you were giving mm-hmm. their student your students over this project, over this unit. Well, I tried. I mean, it was it was so much. I have struggled so much the last two years with lack of engagement. I, that's what the point was. How do I get these kids involved? Mm-hmm. How do I get them to take ownership? Could you see an improved amount of engagement? Yeah. I, I had more of these assignments turned in than any other assignment all year. They worked on it, and they got to the last eight. Well, I didn't finish. Fine. Get up and present what you've done. Mm-hmm. You've done something. Yeah. Present what you've done. At least get some credit. What did that presentation look like? Like in the, like what was, were they different? What was your ideal student's presentation? What was that going to look like? Well, I gave them a sample to look at. Okay. And then that's going to be in the resource folder. But then I also, um, we use, I have Chromebooks. So we used Google Slides. And then the kids stood up and there'll be a video link as well. So you guys can see the presentations. Thank you. Um, But it just basically turned out like uh, the cover slide had to have the book cover and their name, and it couldn't be multi-genre por- <laughs> portfolio. I said, you have to come up with a different title. It's like when, if you ever watched a movie called Movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, we're looking at one now, and she read All American Boys, which is a fabulous book. Have you read it? So good. I love it. Yeah. Oh, I love All American Boys. Um, and so did she. Some of them I had to do book talks on. You know, that's kind of interesting as a choice because it's only, it's not it's not two perspective poetry, but it's kind of two yeah. perspective prose. Yeah. And then the poetry. So this one is about police brutality, and they had to include the, where they got it. Um, they did a typecast on each of the poems, which is an AP strategy uh, for poetry analysis. And God, where was this when I was going through school? <laughs> Can I ask you? I feel, I, I, I don't know what typecast is. It is, um, th- we do it through the AP. It's, uh, it's an acronym, of course, because everything in AP is acronyms. <laughs> um, but the first T is what is your gut reaction to the title? Before you even read the poem, what do you think the poem's about? Okay. And then P, then they read it through. And then they have to paraphrase, what is the poem about? Okay. And then C, uh, C is co- connotation. And I take it a little further um, because you're, sp- you know, underlying meaning. What I make them do, this is where we do the analysis, um, where I make them pick five literary devices that are used in the poem, and they have to show me how they know that's what it was. So rhyme scheme. How do you know that's the rhyme scheme? Yeah. And then um, the A in TP cast is the attitude, so speaker's tone. Mm-hmm. And uh, S is where does this shift occur? Like kind of like a maybe like a climactic point. Yeah, pretty much because every poem shifts at some point, and some poems have multiple shifts. Mm-hmm. The next to the last T is title again. How has your perception of the title changed after you've read it and analyzed it? Okay, how do you think differently about the poem? And then the last one is theme. What is the theme of the poem? Okay, so just to recap that, so we've got, and this is mostly for myself because I am learning so much today. And I have to say, that was a, that's a benefit of the suggestion box that I, I didn't anticipate. And wow, that sounds like so conceited. Like, I'm like, I'm going to go talk to other teachers about what they do. And it just didn't occur to me that I'm going to learn so much. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to be tuning in so I can learn more stuff. <laughs> Good, thank you. All right, so we have T-P-C-A-S-T-T. Right. Okay. Right. And so they would do that, and then... Um, some of them did a blackout poem as well. So those were cool. And then there's the two voice poem. I'm a police officer. I am a student. I beat on people. I get beat on. And then both voices say, we live in the same area. The, uh, the police officer, I act innocent. The student, I am innocent. I have badges and titles. I have bruises and bandages. 
We are both afraid. Oh my goodness. Ooh, that that gave me goosebumps. Yeah. I wonder too. There's an episode that we have that's that's going to be out prior to this one by Dr. Devereaux and Dr. Krovitz, who wrote Grammar to Get Things Done. Mm -hmm. And this would be an excellent opportunity to talk about, like, if you if anybody wanted to incorporate some grammatical structures, like talking about how that this is phrased, like the I am puts the emphasis on the person versus like, like if you were to phrase it differently to make it so. But like, there's a lot of self self interpretation. That's so neat. Yeah, and so. Every two voice poem I've had kids write, it's just, yeah, it gives you goosebumps. Yeah. It's like, where did this come from? Yeah. Can I ask you a logistical question sure. from like the teacher part of me that is, is uh, maybe a little, a little scared of grading in my head? How, what kind of, so they built their own rubrics yeah. and they made them specific. Did they have like, oh gosh, I hate the, I hate these two words, folks, but I'm about to say them. Did they have like sentence requirements or like word lengths? I told them for the two voice poem, they had to have eight lines. Eight. Okay. But I didn't specify, because poetry, you don't have sentences. Right. You know, you have phrases. Um, The only reason I do requirements is to get them to go deeper. Yes. And I think that I've had very similar experiences as I've thought, as I've tried a couple of times to talk to the entire class and be like, I'm not going to do sentence requirements, but I want you to push yourselves and inevitably, inevitably more don't than do. Yeah. So when they stand up and present, do they, do they explain? With the presentation, I had them, (laughs) and we did a cheat sheet on the backboard so they can see okay here's my book <laughs> here's the author of the book here's what I'm most proud of and here's the th- part I struggled the most with and if I had to do this project over again this is what I would do and that's all their presentation was and some of them got a little carried away because I told them two minutes guys it's all I want is a two minute presentation I had some kids that tried to go on for seven eight minutes oh yeah because they were so excited about their book. That's, I mean, that's a good problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at one point, also, in the middle of this, um, I, I tried to break it up a little bit so we weren't doing a lot of workshopping, mm-hmm. because these kids love... Our students today are so verbal. Mm-hmm. The Socratic seminar, oh my God, and philosophical chairs are the way to go. Yeah. So I had them sit down and do book talks, uh, one day, we sat down and did a Socratic seminar on our books, and we just talked about the social issues and how the adult author, uh, young adult author, implemented. Why did they pick those social issues? Well, the scary thing was, is it happened like two days after Parkland's shooting. Mm. And we had, none of the books I, we, they had picked dealt with school shootings, but a lot of them dealt with suicide, bullying, Um, substance abuse, that kind of thing. So it really hit home. So it was really kind of interesting to see, uh, we were talking about the kids who came, the Parkland students who came out and they had a voice. And we used that as a launch pad for having a voice in young adult literature, having a voice in curriculum. And then the cool thing was in one class, they started talking about it and they said, well, how do we have our own voice here at school? Whoa. And it just so happened we had a student government representative in that class. And so we started off talking about the books. And then we moved on to social issues. And then we moved on to the national scene. Uh-huh. And then they brought it back on their own to the local scene. How do we have an impact here at Southeast? The conversation went so far. And now I'm getting goosebumps still talking about it. The conversation kept going and the bell rang and they said mrs Kong, can we come in at lunch and continue this conversation uh yeah (laughs) (laughs) so they came in and started brainstorming ways to have an impact uh, on the school during the lunch period then the weird thing happened the principal walks by and they were so passionate and so excited and so loud (laughs) that the principal walks by my room and pokes her head in wanting to know what's going on. Yeah. Well, with that conversation, then they set up a meeting with her so that they could talk about, okay, how can students have more of an impact at Southeast? That's awesome. That is the ideal. Yeah. That you take it from the classroom to the community in a way where you have empowered students to, like, let loose. And it was like, (laughs) oh! 
That's so cool. That's so cool. Okay, so in that moment, because I know a mistake that I've made with several like opportunities for discussion is that I don't give my kids enough background information. I'm like, hey, what are your feelings on this? And I just assume they'll have instinctive feelings. But I love how you've given them all of this background. Like you're teaching, but you've also been pre-teaching up to this yeah. point that builds to this apex of them being like, we could we could help. Like we yeah. have ideas too, and that's the goal, right? These right. like like independent thinkers. Yeah. So how long does your multi-genre unit go? This one went six weeks. Six weeks. Okay. I started it the first week of February, and we ended right, they did their presentations right before spring break. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, I had a couple of kids who made suggestions, and it's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, I just want to say the power of suggestions. It's really important. Yes. <laughs> um, they said, why can't? we like what you've done, but can we knock back the number of images and maybe cut back images and have a song that relates to the book or a movie that relates to the book and then do the analysis. Mm, interesting. It's like, you guys want to analyze more stuff? What? Go ahead. <laughs> I just thought images would be easier, but I'm probably going to do that. I'm going to cut the images back and then have them do okay, what is a song that connects to the novel mm -hmm. or your social issue and analyze it? So, like, the, 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 the results you got from this from both your student engagement as well as, like, the data of, like, more students turned in this assignment than anything all year and just also the data of them saying that they liked it in their yeah. argumentative essays. Oh, we didn't touch on that very much. Tell me about how did the argumentative essays go? What were, did they, like, what were your expectations? How did that line out? Well, it was how would this approach to literature be more or less engaging than standardized tests or worksheet. Is it better? Why or why not? And like I said, three of them said, no, the uh, standardized tests are better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of them went, oh, no, we need to do this, and all teachers should adopt it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, though, how some kids do... Like, I think there's just that, that, that back and forth. That it's interesting how some kids do want, like, very much so to, like, sit with a notebook and a pencil mm -hmm. and listen to you talk at them right. for 45 to 90 minutes and then to take a test. Some kids want that. But, gosh, it's so few for how many of us are teaching that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is absolutely fantastic. This whole, I have learned so much in the last, you know, in the, the, the time that we have been interviewing. So thank you so much, Terilyn, for coming on today, for sharing this with everybody. I can't imagine that anybody will walk away from this podcast without having something to draw from it. There were so many aspects. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Yep. And uh, there is going to be, like we said, there is going to be a folder of, it has my lesson plans, my overview, and some examples. Okay, and we'll make sure to have Carolyn's email in the show notes below so you can reach out to her. So thank you so, so, so much. We have, we have learned today. And that's always the goal, isn't it, Suggestion Box listeners? It's always the goal. Thank you so much to all of our viewers for tuning in today. Make sure if you enjoyed this uh, episode of the Suggestion Box, support the show by leaving us a review on iTunes, which is maybe called Apple Podcasts. I don't know. It's confusing to me leave us a review, subscribe. We are also out on Google Play and YouTube and SoundCloud, and hopefully we'll be wherever you can find podcasts. We're also on our website, the thesuggestionboxpodcast.com. Make sure that you find us. We're here for you. If you want to reach out to us, let us know of an amazing lesson, unit, strategy, anything happening in your classroom or in your school that really gets you excited, share it with us. Maybe we'll contact you for an interview. Uh, so website or the thesuggestionboxpodcast at gmail.com. Also, take a look at our social media. We are the Suggestion Box Podcast everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We are everywhere as the Suggestion Box Podcast. Just look us up. We would really, really appreciate it. I want to hear from you. I want to hear about all the cool things you do. We can't ever anticipate what we're going to learn from each other. So let's learn together. That's what we're all about. Special, special thank you to Dr. Heather and Dr. Roger Caswell, the magical folks who make this podcast a reality every day. Thank you so much to our lovely graphic designer, who is always above and beyond, and to Sonic Tonic Audio, who is responsible for the intro and outro music that you hear in today's podcast. See you next time, teachers. Teachers.